So, uh, thinking about the Aurora and to Live Week for uh, for having me here. I'm Darren Block. Uh, uh, my, job, my job title actually recently changed from what's in your program, so I'm now a senior advisor to Mayor Bill de Blasio here, focusing on strategic partnerships. And on behalf of the mayor and the city, uh, let me start by uh, let me start by welcoming you to New York. If you've been here before, welcome. If you uh, if it's your first time, uh, the city isn't quite always this crowded, but we're uh, we're, we're trying to manage. So uh, thank you. And and when I was invited to join. Um, it was really a neat opportunity because for the last uh, several years, I've uh, been at an interesting perch, leading an organization called the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City. And prior to that, I had spent about 15 years working uh, in the business sector, nonprofit sector, and, and around government. And what, what the Mayor's Fund was created to do was to be a intentional partner building public-private partnerships between government and business sector, the nonprofit sector, service sectors, and the rest. And it, it's amazing work at an amazing time. It's amazing work because the amount of uh, civic goodwill and interest in supporting New York and New Yorkers in need uh, runs deep, and that's amazing. But it's an, it's an amazing time for all of us thinking about uh, impact investing and civic investing, and there's an amazing amount of energy in this space. On a personal note, I'm just a deep believer in the power of partnership and the idea that we find some of our greatest ideas through collaboration um, and through that type of, of uh, attacking problems together. So it's, it's from that perch um, that it was, uh, it was compelling to think about this idea of an impact economy and this intersection of NGOs and business and philanthropy and government. I'm going to start very quickly uh, on a little bit of some atmospherics and context in which I see this kind of partnership work in this intersection building. Uh, this is this is not going to start off as news to anybody in this room, but the, the way it affects our discussion around partnership is is, uh, is interesting and is noteworthy. So the last the last several years, there's been this increasing aggregation of wealth, uh, you know, in the top one percent. And this is not a new trend, but the 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 balance and the magnitude with which that wealth is aggregating into a few players, individuals philanthropy, business, and the like, uh, groups that are not part of some kind of, uh, not part of some kind of uh, accountable public system is, is interesting. So we have this, this group of free agents, independent actors, who are advancing social impact and social good, which is amazing. It's, it's, it's a terrific time that folks are thinking about that. But it's also interesting to think about these players as not tied to any part of what we have generally built around to solve some of our big problems. Individuals, families, business, and philanthropy uh, making these types of, of decisions and choices. So that's just an interesting thing to think about. What's the effect of that wealth obligation? You combine that with what's always been a little bit of a tension in this country and, and, and throughout about what's the role of government and, and what and how much uh, should we be deploying and aggregating government to solve these problems? Again, not a new trend, but I feel like in the last five or ten years there's been more intensity around that discussion and more tension and resistance about seeing government as, as able to solve big problems and in a position to solve big problems. And there's a legitimate uh, policy discussion and political discussion to be had around what that looks like, that resistance to looking at government. And some of that's happening a few blocks from here, and that's good, and, and it could be a little bit of this discussion. But, but the interesting part of that is we have government simultaneously trying to solve big problems, but also constantly under pressure about the resources they have to do this. And to put that into perspective a little bit, we looked at the five, uh, some of the five more prominent philanthropies here in New York, working here in New York and, and at large. And you know, it's it goes without saying that uh, that government remains, even with that pressure and resistance to how much we're investing in government. Government remains our largest impact investor uh, by a long shot. And so, uh, you know, even these five amazing philanthropies doing great work. Uh, uh, you know, in, in here in New York and beyond, it's remarkable when we look at just what that scale and size of that impact is when compared to just one year of a budget of what New York City spends. And so thinking about how 
this conversation about the role of philanthropy and the role of, um, of civic investors in our society, how that wealth is being aggregated, how that wealth is being deployed. When I think about this type of, of conference and the notion of, of impact investing and, and these intersections of uh, different players coming in, I, I come back to this type of scale um, when I think about uh, what I see as a compelling theory of change. And it's basically around the idea that if business and philanthropy are not deploying their social investing in coordination with government, the gains made are gonna be narrow and limited. To be clear, great gains made. Love all the investing, love all the work in that. But for me, this is a theory of change and, and, a, and an idea that we need to be mindful of. And because if the goal for all of us is what does impact at scale look like, I would suggest that that's rarely, if ever possible, if government isn't a partner in some way. And let me be clear here at the start. Uh, government is not without its many problems. It's, it's bureaucratic. It's simultaneously slow and resistant to change. But on the flip side of that, it can also be hyper-responsive when we are required to adjust to crisis. It is simultaneously hyper-focused on getting results. And it, there's a high level of accountability at the highest levels of government but it's also highly insulated from customers and constituencies through its bureaucracies. So it, it has these tensions. And partnership itself is a challenge, right? It's, it's time consuming. It requires a sharing of responsibilities and credits. Uh, it requires us to compromise on what we need to do and how we need to do it, and seeding of some power and control in that. So all of that said, I still see government as where we collectively work to invest our biggest challenges. It is how we pool our resources around uh, collective and community priorities and goals. And so through that lens, I kind of look at this and say, well, if that is where we are pooling our resources at scale to solve these problems, it just, to me, goes without saying that we should be making every attempt we can to align our private spending, our social impact spending with government, with what government is doing. And in the, in, in, in the uh, even where we can't align it, we should be trying to connect and build those types of systems. So, so it's through this lens that I want to just bring up a couple of examples of what we've done here in New York to create some of that infrastructure and to see some of this build. One of these projects is our Computer Science for All initiative. It was launched in 2015 by Mayor Bill de Blasio. And and the idea was how can we bring computer science, computer literature to every level of our city's public school system. So we want every school to have a computer science curriculum. We want every student at every step of the ladder to be uh, exposed to a, a computer science uh, literacy and, uh, uh, and learnings. It is arguably the most ambitious commitment for computer science education in the country. And the work that we built is based on some deep research around um, the types of curricula to apply, uh, the types of um, uh, infrastructure to build here. And it was uh, conceptualized through an interesting uh, blend of partnerships. We have here in New York a nonprofit called the Fund for Public Schools, which is embedded in the New York City public school system. And it's tasked with being this connective tissue for external partners that want to partner with the city. And the Fund for Schools worked in partnership with another nonprofit called CSNYC, which had been a leading effort by a local, uh, uh, local uh, tech investor, a civic investor, Fred Wilson, who had this idea of what would computer science uh, learning and training look like at scale. And so with these two nonprofits working in partnership, we were able to survey the landscape about what was working. We were able to map out a type of professional development infrastructure for all of our teachers. We were able to put some rigorous uh, tracking and metrics around measures and uh, outputs and outcomes. Really everything you would want to see in a uh, innovative, uh, evidence-based plan at scale. The model is fantastic. We're getting results. We're moving folks along. We have terrific partners that signed on to, to join us in our efforts. And so for me, this is an interesting and really a perfect example of what public-private partnership with government can look like. I'll pause here, though, to, to note one thing, which is just an interesting note in the culture of doing this. And it's that even as we engage partners, and there are many partners listed here and others coming on board every week, every month, 
it's been remarkable how many partners doing this work, making massive investments in computer science, still resist coming into the fold of a larger effort. And, and here, what, what's revealing to me, and I think what's useful to just think about, is the culture that we have that creates this effort to have um, differentiation of brand, that has a, you know, an effort where um, we're trying to come up with some kind of competitive advantages, which work to create um, uh, great innovation in a competitive landscape of business and such. But when we're talking about partnership, these are our pressure points that run counter to the types of instincts that we need for successful partners. I don't have a great answer to that cultural challenge, but I pointed out as something that I think we constantly need to be working towards to find a better blend of how we take what's usually driving innovation in one sector, and when we think about it in this kind of partnership in these intersecting sectors, we can kind of bring um, you know, bring more thought from the same. Another example of some of the connective tissue we've created here in New York uh, is around our Center for Youth Employment. The idea we had here was what can we do as a city to bring better coordination to the workforce readiness infrastructure we have for our, our young adults and our, our youth here in New York. We wanted to have some kind of effortless trajectory as uh, a young person is on their road to college and career readiness and their own independence. And the idea was how do we create this uh, shared space where uh, the different parties that are contributing to some of this work, philanthropy, certainly the government through the school system or otherwise, industry, and other civic investors can think about this and work on these efforts together. The idea was to develop this Center for Youth Workforce uh, Center for uh, Youth Employment. And what we did was we sought out philanthropy to invest in a small impact team, if you will, inside of government that would work to have some kind of independence from the infrastructures of government. It was privately supported. And what that enabled was a certain level of, of being uh, rigorous around what government was doing. It could help be an advocate. It could help nudge government. It could help spot for philanthropy and others what government was doing to help align some of those interests and some of that work. And we're seeing great results. We're far from where we need to be, but we're starting to see some real movement around and shifts in city budgets, in what philanthropy is thinking about, in how industry is thinking about interacting with the city. And, and that, to me, is an interesting model of how are we creating connective tissue with government where it did not previously exist. That said, I want to point out one note, which again was revealed through this process, that I think is worth just thinking a little bit about. And it's around a effort that we saw as a, as a there, there are very few silver bullets in this space, but if you look at research around youth, uh, youth development, the, uh, the opportunity to have early work experience and exposure is transformational. It helps with, uh, with school attendance. It helps with high school graduation. It, accelerates earnings later years. And so we saw this, this amazing opportunity with a fairly simple intervention. How do we get more kids exposed to the workforce? And yet, when we saw how we needed to do that, you saw that scale being created through partnership with business, with industry, outside of government. And, and I'll say, and this is one example of one of our programs, we have many doing this work, but Ladders for Leaders was an, is an example of a program where we sought to blend this model? How could the city engage business to help bring more uh, youth into the, into the workforce with a summer internship or some exposure like that? And with this program, early on, we had a very, very modest group of employers. We had about 80 or so employers as part of this program. And as we started to put attention on it, we had some pretty rapid uh, pickup of employers who understood the value of one to be part of it. We moved from 80 or so to well over 500. So good work was happening and we were all pretty happy with it. However, to give some sense of scale of what that is, we had over 8,000 applications in this one program alone. And so when you think about 8,000 applications and the fact that we have over 200,000 businesses here in New York, we are a long way from how are we creating culture change within the business sphere about how business, in a very micro way, very on the ground way, can partner with this type of change making impact. To be clear at this point, there are companies, I'm sure, in this room and well beyond that are doing some great internship work within their own ranks. They have 
uh, their own uh, labeled internship programs that is thinking about internship at scale. And that's terrific, and I don't want to, um, I'm not trying to disparage that type of work. But the point is, if investments are being made by all of us, and massive investments are being made by the city in this instance to think about internship, and here, the city is investing over $70 million in creating connective tissue, training, recruitment, follow up with youth. And so this is an infrastructure that we are all investing in here and in other cities and states across the, the country and the world. If business is not somehow tapping into that, I'm just suggesting that we are missing an opportunity for us to collectively work at scale on some of that, on some of that work. All of which goes back to me to, a, uh, to an idea that we just need to do more to build and expand partnership infrastructure within and alongside government. And if that doesn't exist, that type of infrastructure, we need to find it and create it. And where it does exist, we need to support it and invest in it. And whether that's through a program like the Mayor's Fund or the Fund for Public Schools, which I mentioned before, which are these nonprofits that sit inside or alongside government explicitly to think about partnership, or whether it's creating a new type of partnership paradigm the way we did for our Center for Youth Employment, either of those types of supports are going to advance what type of investments we're making in, uh, in these types of areas. <laughs> Just to give you a quick lens about what we've created here in New York, it's a fairly uh, mature infrastructure, though I think there's still work that we can always be doing. We have here um, uh, seven explicit city-affiliated nonprofits that work in these specific areas around what we're doing in the school system through the Fund for Public Schools and what we're doing in our public housing system with the Fund for Public Housing or what we're doing at the Mayor's Fund or the Fund for Public Health that are addressing these individual uh, issues and areas. But even if it's um, under a different issue, I would suggest that this type of infrastructure provides some real efficiencies and really fosters a model for growth. This type of, of model uh, helps us maintain networks across sectors. It helps navigate the bureaucracies that we find in and around government. It lowers transaction costs of how government deploys some of these uh, types of innovations and approaches. And to give you a sense of scale, here in New York, when we look back on our first four years in this administration, of this aggregation of work, we were able to raise and deploy through these types of partner models over $400 million that was deployed within and alongside government. And that's to say there are, again, other great investments being made in the city and beyond to affect this. But I would say that that, that number, that $400 million, is is compounding the investment even more by working alongside government and, uh, and using a term that I'm sure will be used uh, several times today in this conference, leveraging what that investment is. And to me, that, that is, if that is all of our collective goals, trying to pursue this type of model um, is really uh, something for us all to think about. And I would note, New York is no doubt an outlier. We have a, a large share of civic minded institutions, philanthropy, business, and just the sheer size of New York sometimes helps in this area. But I just want to point out that this is a model that scales. And just over the last four years, we've had conversations with dozens of cities and states and, and counties um, uh, and other countries looking at how we've created that infrastructure of partnering alongside government. So it's something that, that we've seen uh, gathering momentum. It's something that I would say uh, deserves our, our attention as we go forward. So I'll just say, with all of that in mind, uh, kind of I'd leave us with uh, two or three kind of calls to action for us all. If you are from a city, state, a country, uh, an area doing this type of work, working with government, I say terrific, great, keep it going, be, be, a, uh, uh, be a cheerleader for this type of work. And if you're going home to an area that doesn't have that type of infrastructure, I would challenge you to think about where and how you can construct it and invest in it. And that might be resources, that might be people power, that might be some other type of, of impact. And I'd say if you're part of an organization that is not directly working with government, um, I would say, uh, and I would challenge you to take the steps to reach out and to try to make that work. And it might not work right away, and that's fine. You might find uh, a real connection, but I would suggest that the sheer effort of connecting with government and trying to sort of uh, uh, combine the, the collective power of our investments, the, the system and the efforts, even if it does not result in a partnership, is going to make for a stronger result 
for all of us. And that is ultimately what we are all trying to accomplish. So those are, that's my food for thought for the day. As we start our conference, I want to thank Magda and Live Week for the, uh, for the invitation. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of the time. Thank you.